Welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. I am sincerely honored today to have the opportunity to interview Dr. Mike Hutchins, a Professor Emeritus at uh, the University of Illinois Department of Animal Science. Um, Dr. Hutchins is very, very well known in the dairy world. Uh, he can tell us if this is up to date, but uh, last I knew he was giving 60 to 70 talks a year at, at lots of big events, uh, online webinars, has been uh, very innovative in adopting new technologies to be effective in his extension work um, and has not slowed down one step as far as I can tell since he officially retired. So Dr. Hutchins, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's my pleasure and honor, Barry, to uh, join the, uh, the Dairy Podcast and hopefully we'll have some good discussion and points that listeners will enjoy. Absolutely. So can you start with uh, giving us a little bit of background of how did you end up as a professor in dairy science? Like, What got you here? Well, it's, it's an interesting, and uh, we won't try to go too long on this, but I grew up on a dairy farm near Green Bay, Wisconsin. So that kind of plants the seed, active in 4-H and FFA and all those, those organizations as well. I then had the opportunity to go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and where I got all my three degrees. And yes, I know you're supposed to move around, but uh, for me, it was just a, a better fit. I got uh, my master's in mastitis detection on DNA analysis and then on PhD in the ruminant nutrition area. So that's kind of how it started. Then I went on and spent eight years at the University of Minnesota from 1971 to 1979 as extension dairy specialist. And unfortunately, on timely death there, I also assumed some teaching responsibility added on when that individual passed on. Then in 1979, I had a chance to go to the University of Illinois, and uh, that's where I made it home for 32 years. So uh, basically, I had uh, 40 years primarily in the extension and teaching arena. Uh, I had no research appointment, which has been unusual, and probably you would not find that anymore here at the University of Illinois or perhaps even Michigan State. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, I'm curious, you switched from working on mastitis in your master's, you said, to nutrition focus for your PhD. What, what was the evolution of your um, interest there, I guess? Well, Barry, it's interesting because uh, I stayed with the same major professor, Dr. L.H. Schultz at Wisconsin. I really was very comfortable with his style. He was an interesting professor. He always wore a tie every day. Even when we took blood samples at the farm, he had his tie on. So he was a very professional uh, individual. Uh, when I got my master's degree, I did it in mastitis. And then I said, since I'm not changing to another university, I probably need to go to a different program area. And he also had an area in his research lab that had on, on room and nutrition. He did some classic work on NICE and metabolism milk fat depression was an area he worked on and so I said well let, let's do that so that's why the two different areas rather than switching universities my goal was to uh, get done we were married at the time and had a child and I'm saying you know a living as a graduate student um, it's it's pretty pretty a meager uh, living as far as that goes so it's barely pays for diapers right <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh that's that's really fascinating thanks for sharing that so one thing I thought we could uh, focus on today, um, I, I'd be really curious to hear your perspectives on this. Um, so you've been kind of in the dairy research world through a window of time where analysis and understanding of fiber has really evolved right over your career, um, even going back to when NDF was first defined. And I wonder if you could kind of talk us through the way you think about that evolution over the last 30 or 40 years. Well, I think, Barry, uh, the, the, the whole topic of fiber to me is, is quite exciting. It, it, to me, it's one of the real cutting edge places we're at right now, not only in research area, but also on, on farms. And, and we make farm visits. We look at forages being produced now. Uh, we're hearing such thing as low lignin forages coming on, on the scene. So th therefore, there's, th there's new products, there's new technologies, new methods, new new lab analysis as far as that goes. But Barry, you're right, after 50 years, and basically I've got 50 years from the time I got I started my first job until uh, today, 50 plus actually, uh, crude fiber was a big deal. 
you know, we talked about crude fiber and why fiber was important. And then, as you pointed out, uh, we then uh, went into the uh, uh, ADF, NDF aspects as far as that goes. And, and certainly that was a tremendous improvement as far as that goes. And now we just continue to refine, especially NDF. That appears to be, as I jokingly call it, the 100-pound gorilla in the room. Uh, ADF, I, I'm old school yet. I still look at acid detergent fiber. To me, it gives me a bit of an idea of, uh, of, of the fiber dynamics in a ration because we're looking primarily at the less digestible fractions, where the NDF, of course, is, is a total fraction uh, of the fiber as well. And so now we've got some really new approaches, both analytically, also in terms of how we relate it to the dairy cow. Absolutely. Yes. Do, do you have examples? Because I, I didn't, I wasn't around at that phase. You know, when people switch from thinking about crude fiber to NDF, were there examples of things that it just became clear, oh, this, this isn't going to work anymore? Or was it not that clear cut? No, I, I just think your your points will take, and I, I think the the NDF uh, really just opened up and says, you know, the fiber is different. Uh, crude fiber was pretty basic. You know, we'd be looking at fifteen or seventeen percent crude fiber in a ration. And, uh, that would include, well, did it come from soy hulls? Did it come from corn silage? Did it come from alfalfa or grasses? And crude fiber kind of puts it all in kind of one big pot and stir it, where the NDFs allow us to actually subdivide fiber. And I think, Barry, in the future, we're not only going to look at balancing rations on NDF, uh, we're going to balance them on basically cellulose, hemicellulose, and we're already looking We're already looking at lignin. So we're, we're going to subdivide it down, just like we did on the crude protein aspects. We, we're not looking at amino acids. We're not just looking at at, at, a, at crude protein or metabolizable protein or absorbable protein. So, and of course, that also applies to our, our mineral analysis. Now we're looking at absorbable mineral or bioavailable minerals. So, I, I think we're going to continue to see uh, these refining in the fiber area. We, we now have uh, some. Uh, excitement in the area of NDF digestibility. That's kind of a, that's an old term now. It certainly uh, was a real breakthrough as uh, in my career, as far as say, you know, not all alfalfas, not all grasses, not all small grains are created equal. Uh, they, they have different available uh, digestibilities of the NDF and that, that's huge. And of course, Michigan State did some of the cutting research in Mike Allen's lab up there looking at that after every one point increase we get in NDF digestibility, we're going to get about a half a pound more milk and associated dry matter intake. So that, that has some real value on dairy farms as far as uh, its application. And of course, now the new kid on the block is going to be UNDF. We're looking at undigestible NDF. And of course, the excitement about that is going to be a fill factor. In other words, uh, we can use that on farms or in classrooms or in research to determine and control, actually control dry matter intake. And we do that in dry cow programs. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So you brought up a lot of good terms. Um, undigested NDF, we're talking about NDF digestibility, kind of two sides of the same coin. We also have to bring particle size of the forage to the practical aspect of that in because that influences the rumen. And it starts to become a lot more to handle than just NDF, right? Or NDF and ADF. So from a very uh, practical standpoint, if I asked you to put together a diet for Bessie that's over here making 100 pounds of milk. Where do you start in that process? What numbers do you turn to first and, and what do you use more for troubleshooting? Yeah, and I'm going to stay pretty much, Barry, unless we want to go broader than that, but we'll kind of stay in the fiber area. That's kind of the focus of today's uh, podcast as far as that goes. And so I'm, I'm looking at uh, basically uh, NDF. Now, let's start with NDF on the forage level. Uh, I'm targeting somewhere in that 28 to 32 percent of the total ration dry matter as NDF. And of course, now the new term is, of course, uh, A, which stands for amylase treated NDF. So we get rid of any uh, residual starch. And then we put another initial at the back end of NDF is OM, organic matter. So we now we correct for ash. And of course, it makes small changes, but if you really want to be uh, right on the money, you'll use uh, the new labs. We'll give you, in fact, that's one of the real challenges. Our labs will give us uh, 10 or 12 different fiber values. And my dairy farmer will say, well, which one are, are any of these valuable? Do I have to use all 12 of them? We come back and circle back to that 
that one as well. So I'll be looking at the level of the, the new NDF and the ration, and, and I, I would like to see that somewhere in that range there. Uh, if we get up in the over the 30 range, I'm now going to be looking at byproduct NDFs coming into play, uh, soy hull, uh, beet pulp, uh, the corn gluten feeds, those kinds of things, because those fibers have a different dynamics in the feeding program and still keeps the rumen fairly healthy and the rumen environment correct. So, so once I get the NDF levels there, by the way, I'll be look, I'll be watching ADF. I probably don't balance for it, but I'm looking at somewhere between 18 and 21 percent ADF. When you get over 21, then I get pretty nervous that I may now have a, a, a fiber that's going to have a lower value. Okay for growing heifers and dry cows and low-producing cows, but as you pointed, that 100-pound cow uh, every day, that cow has to put away some 50 pounds of dry matter in 24 hours. So it means that it's got to be out of the way, but those nutrients have to be extracted. So this rate of passage and, and, and dry matter intake becomes key because it really drives uh, amino acid yield from the micro and microbes, and it also is important from the uh, VFA production as well. So once I get the NDF squared away, then I'm going to look at the particle size. And of course, I'm a big fan of the Penn State particle separator that came out of Penn State. And uh, therefore, I'm, and so now I'm going to look at the physical form of that fiber. Uh, do I have enough length? And now it looks like the real magic box, I use that carefully, of course, is uh, the number eight, the eight millimeter screen. And people are saying, I need to have about 50 plus percent of my total ration uh, sitting on that screen there. And uh, the top screen, which is longer, I think is now carrying itself. That's where my long fibers are, but we're seeing a much lower number there. It looks like the new number is somewhere between two to five to seven percent of that. Not only that number, but that I look at that to see if anything is over about an inch and a half or two inches, because now we're starting to be concerned about sorting issues as far as that goes. And I smile here because uh, the, the, I had a chance to go to Europe and there they will chop their silages, uh, corn silage especially, because they use it as an energy source in the digesters down to a quarter of an inch length. You know, and, and of course, not only do they sell that to the uh, bio group, but they also feed that to their cows. And, and, and so they have something they call a compact TMR. And I, I looked at that and I'm saying, wow, uh, nothing longer than a quarter of an inch in length, uh, running very wet as far as that goes. And yet the, some farmers uh, seem to have success with that approach, which kind of violates a lot of my guidelines, but but I've been mentioning it in our, in, in our podcast here. So particle size of the fiber along with the NDF levels is going to be important. I'm still old school because my labs give me those numbers. I'll be looking at rations. Somewhere is around two and a half to three and a half percent lignin. Lignin, of course, has zero digestibility. So as a result, it, it, it means that, uh, that that's going to be another fraction that comes into play. And I smile because we uh, we have farmers still feeding straw to cows. And, and, you're, and our listeners are saying straw. Why would you feed straw to a 100-pound cow? And the answer is I'm trying to control rate of passage in rumen environment. And, and so uh, we're probably seeing less straw being fed because we're now looking at higher forage-based diets with the optimal particle size. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, yeah, the first time I heard about people feeding straw to lactating cows, I kind of thought they were crazy. But with some of the developments we've seen um, in the last decades with lower lignin alfalfa, with um, more digestible corn silage, um, do you think, have you been on herds where you're like, uh, the forages are almost too good to feed a traditional diet. Yeah, I, I think that, that could be a concern. But the good news, Barry, is if the farmer has the inventory, that then opens up the opportunity to go to, say, 60, 65, perhaps even 70 percent of the dry matter coming from forages. And with today's $6 a bushel corn, uh, that really creates a lot of interest because uh, I can then uh, usually homegrown forages are, are, are very economical, basically because farmers control the quality and the quantity of that feed. Now, that's not true if you go to Israel or if you go to even to California. In some cases, uh, forages can be quite expensive. But uh, here in the Midwest, where you and I are located, usually uh, they are very economical because uh, farmers are producing those forages. And uh, the good news is, in most cases, uh, the market value of those forages are twice the cost of production. Although nowadays, with higher fuel and fertilizer prices, uh, that guy, that thumb rule may no longer be true. But it, uh, back, back when things were 
more normal, which with, uh, without all the inflation and, and higher costs, uh, we were looking at, you know, producing corn silage somewhere around uh, $20 a ton on farms in Illinois. And yet my computer program said that corn silage was worth 40 to $50 a ton if you were going to have to replace it with other feedstuffs or, or abide, abide from other farms in the area. So certainly... Uh, uh, I, I love to have a problem where the forages are almost too good because it gives uh, the nutritionist or you and I an opportunity to manipulate the different feeds and amounts and uh, maybe even cheapen up the ration. But your point's well taken. Uh, that question comes up if I use low lignin alfalfa and low lignin sorghum sedan grass and BMR corn silage, oh, where's my fiber going to come from? And of course, if it's if it's not processed correctly and fed at adequate levels, uh, then then the the old straw thumb rule comes into play that may be needed to maintain good room and health. Absolutely. Yeah. I think all your points are excellent. I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch over the next decades um, in the middle part of the country here, if land prices continue to escalate at the rate they're going. And obviously if you're grand, if you're grandfathered in, you own the land, then that's one thing, but um, the economics on some of that's going to, going to be heavily influenced by land costs, I think. Yeah, Barry, I think your point's well taken uh, in the podcast. Uh, uh, you know, you get down here in Illinois and some of this really lush land uh, that's going because it's close, it's located correctly, the speculators coming in, you know, uh, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 an acre. Uh, I think it's really tough to put a pencil to that and, ma and, and, and make money from that aspect there. But then again, I smile. I just saw recently that our land prices uh, in this last year went up 22% in Illinois. Now, where else could you invest your some of your money and get a 22% return on investment? And as my dad always said, bless his soul, they aren't making any more of that land. So in other words, it's a pretty fine uh, input, you know, unlike gold or oil or, or other inputs we can take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. So we've kind of already touched on this, but I did want to dig in a little bit, um, specifically on corn silage. So... It remains the dominant forage for dairy cattle in the U.S. That's not true everywhere in the world, but it's very critical to our system here. Um, what, looking back again a little bit, what do you think have been the most important developments in genetics or, or what have you in terms of corn silage production for dairies over the past 20, 30 years? Well, this, this will be kind of a biased answer, Barry, and you may not want to agree with that, or maybe some of your staff in Michigan State wouldn't agree with that. But I, I, I think the uh, the high levels of starches we're seeing in our corn silages is, 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 is really a big factor. Uh, here in Illinois, if you aren't producing corn silage that's going to be in the mid-30% starch, then you might want to look at a different hybrid or a different day length or wh whatever the case is going to be. So certainly uh, the, the, the tremendous yields of starches and digestion Adjustable NDF, and that that's a, another new factor I think that has really come into play, and that is trying to select what we call corn silage hybrids. Uh, these are corn uh, silage or hybrids that are bred specifically for uh, for both starch content and uh, NDF digestibility along with yield. And of course, now we're putting all the other traits on top of this. Uh, so nowadays we're looking at, uh, you know, the, the ability to reduce some of the uh, uh, risks with uh, insect diseases, fung fungal diseases, and then weed control as well. So the, the corn silage that my dad had certainly back in the 50s and 60s certainly is not what we're seeing here in a 20 in, in, in the 2020 time window as well. So genetics have become a really big factor uh, in, in that and just a lot of different choices farmers can take a look at. Certainly the, the kernel processor, which is a relatively new technology has really come into play where now we can do a, a very precise job of breaking the corn kernels and in fact ripping open uh, some of the, the plant material to make it more accessible for the rumen microbes. So the, the kernel processor uh, to me has been a big factor on corn silage and of course uh, all dairymen now are doing kernel processing score. The University of Wisconsin developed a really nice system that actually uses a series of sieves and tells us, you know, what percent of the starch is properly processed. And we're looking, uh, used to be the thumb rule was as kernel processing score is 70. You've done a bang up job. Good for you. And now the good farmers are saying, boy, we're, we're shooting for 80. We're going to squeeze all that starch out of that corn silage and make it available for my dairy cows and either in the rumen 
or in the, in the small intestine. So I, I, I think the, the new hybrids we have, and of course now we're starting to ask for hybrids that be more drought resistant with the changing environments we're facing here. Uh, we know some hybrids uh, can handle drought very, very nicely. Here in the Midwest, we have something called tar spot, uh, a new uh, uh, infection that affects corn. And you know, we already know there are, uh, there are hybrids that are much more tolerant to that in terms of uh, an impact tar spot will have. Because tar spot, when we first hit it about three years ago in Illinois, it literally killed the corn crop. And we had guys in August, the corn just died. And boy, they had days, days to try to process it, to try to make it uh, a feed that they can still salvage for the dairy cattle. And in most cases, it got so dry, it turned out to be a very marginal corn silage. So not all corn silage in Illinois turns out perfect, and there's all kinds of management conditions we got to take a look at. Yeah, it is shocking that tar spot, how quickly the corn dries down. It just makes it uh, very challenging. But uh, yeah, I think that there's room for a lot of progress on the disease resistance side, but it seems like we've already made a lot of progress from, from my vantage point on um, weather resilience. I, I, compared to when I was a kid, uh, what these corn genetics can handle in terms of variable rain patterns, I think, is pretty astounding. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really impressed here, Barry. We're sitting in, in Champaign, Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana, and literally we're one of the drought spots in, in, in the Midwest. And yet the crops look super. And and, and, and so it looks like that uh, these corn crops and even the soybeans look good. Uh, are, of course, those combines in the next uh, three or four weeks will, will take all doubt away or in a month to know where we're at. It's just amazing how good this this crop look and and part of the corn crop we think was that we had a very wet uh, fairly a, a lot of subsoil and the corn got a good jump start even though it was late this year uh, those roots went down and so I, I think we uh, until uh, uh, I think we got about an inch and a half two inches of rain and after the mid of June all the way through July and yet that corn crop just kept coming and, and looked really quite good so again some of the um, amazing uh, uh, plant responses to those stresses uh, are, are pretty amazing to me. Yep. So as we speak, we're approaching, uh, depending on what part of the country we're looking at, we're approaching corn silage chopping. And um, one thing I always try to point out to producers to motivate them to put the, the necessary focus on that is even if you're a 500 cow dairy, that's, it's at least a quarter million dollars that uh, a feed that you're putting up in a handful of days. And so doing that right you know, makes all the difference for a big chunk of your input costs. Um, but of course, there's there's a thousand pieces of, of advice around corn silage. So if you had to boil it down to three top pieces of advice about how to, how to make the most out of your corn silage, all the way from growing the corn to harvesting to feeding it, what, what would your top three be? Wow, Barry, that's a fun question to think about. And of course, everybody would have their, their favorite three. I, I'll go back and, and say uh, the first step is getting the right hybrid, uh, depending if you're living in uh, Michigan or if you're living in Southern Illinois, if you're living in Tennessee, got to have the right hybrid. Uh, and that includes all those characteristics we talked about earlier. So I think hybrid selection becomes a, a key factor from that aspect. Then we go in and so we're going to grow the crop. Hopefully we've got the right population count. There's going to be some new research on that too, you know, uh, 30,000 plants per acre, 35,000, 40,000, you know, uh, that's going to be another factor comes into play, but it's not one of my top three. Then I'm going to, I'm going to have to harvest it at the optimal maturity. And we're really focusing in on the dry matter content. Uh, primarily because that feed has to ferment. So if it doesn't ferment properly, then I don't have the good uh, bunk life for, for the for the system as far for the cows as far as that goes. Uh, the old thumb rule is uh, you know uh, two thirds milk uh, two third uh, one third milk line two thirds starch line. That's a nice thumb rule because it shows again a stage of maturity. But depending on growing seasons and hybrids, sometimes uh, that will end up having the wrong dry matter as far as that goes. And then of of course, uh, once I've harvested it, and of course, we already talked about kernel processing. It's not my list of three. Then it's going to be, how do I uh, really pack it? How do I pack it and preserve the quality? So now I'm looking at excluding oxygen, putting a side inoculant on, 
packing it, covering it with an oxygen barrier if I'm in a bunker or pile as far as that goes, and uh, and and trying to exclude the oxygen. Uh, the good news, Barry, there are some new inoculants out that actually will um, uh, grab some of the oxygen and tie it up and convert it. And uh, that's kind of new research as well. So let's review that for our listeners. Number one, hybrid selection. Number two, the optimal stage of maturity. And then third of all, a good job of preserving it so that when I want to feed it to my cows, I've got a quality product that has good bunk stability and feed bunk uh, stability as well. Very good. That's good. Good argument for those three. I like that. So if we, if we take a little broader vantage point and think about overall dairy management, obviously nutrition, uh, we're biased, is the most important piece. But um, where do you think uh, feed efficiency sits in your list of key performance indicators? Is it at the top? How, how critical is that to having a profitable dairy? Well, I'm a little biased on that, Barry, because I, I think feed efficiency is one of the po- most powerful tools I have in my toolbox, and I use it for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I like feed efficiency, and that is because it's looking at milk yield on an energy-corrected basis. So uh, so we're taking out variation of milk fat and protein levels here and say, okay, my herd is averaging 80 pounds. Let's say it's 80 pounds of energy-corrected milk. Then that farmer is going to tell me how many pounds of dry matter uh, this uh, this cow is going to consume. So let's make it simpler. Let's say it's 75 pounds of actual uh, fat, uh, uh, energy corrected milk, and then the 50 pounds of dry matter. This is what they consume. And so I now can relate those two very important factors, a milk yield and, and, and dry matter intake. That feed efficiency I can see and your listeners can see is 1.5. And that's a, in other words, I'm getting 1.5 pounds or kilograms, if you want to use the, uh, the metric system, uh, per pound of dry matter consumed by the cow. And then we know our really high producing cows, that feed efficiency goes up to as high as 1.7, 1.8 at this point. And so it allows me to look at uh, two very important important characteristic of profitability, milk yield and dry matter intake, dry matter now, or feed feed is going to account for probably 50 uh, with higher feed prices now, but everything's gone up as well. 50%, 60% of, of the cost of milk production. And the beauty of it, of course, it has an economic value. Uh, nowadays, uh, each point, in other words, I go from 1.5 to 1.6, that's going to be worth somewhere around 35 to 40 cents more profit because I get the same milk but my cows eat less dry matter. So now that goes back to our earlier discussion about rate of passage, uh, good rumen fermentation, though those kinds of factors as well. And then, of course, I'll have different groups on my farms. Most farms, now our larger farms specifically, will have maybe a high group, a low group, a group of heifers. Uh, I now can look at uh, feed efficiency in those groups to see uh, how good a job those cows are doing as I adjust the ration. So I'm a big fan of feed efficiency. Uh, we have a fun PowerPoint. There's eight. I count and there's probably more than that, 18 different factors on a farm that will impact your feed efficiency. And, and so the, the question is, if yours is too low, which one of those factors are really missing? And then Barry, what's amazing to me, well, one of the big ones is going to be fertility. In other words, I've got to have my cows calving every 13 months. And if they calve 15 or 16 months, now I have way too many days at the tail end of the lactation. And so I lose feed efficiency. It has nothing, nothing to do with your diet, Barry, you put together, or your corn silage or your fiber levels as well. Uh, somatic cell count becomes a, a big factor as well. And, of course, uh, the other big factor is going to be the digestibility of the ration. And that goes right back to our podcast here on NDF digestibilities and factors like that. Great. So I, one thing that I've learned in the last year doing a number of um, feed program audits on farms uh, in Michigan in particular is I guess I've been a, a little bit surprised how few farms are even using the feeding software at a basic level to where uh, probably less than 10% of the farms that I've looked at carefully are doing a decent job of measuring pushouts so that they actually have a decent number for dry matter intake. What's your experience? Is that similar across the country? Yeah, that's that's a big factor. Uh, I'll answer two ways, Barry. Uh, one of our very best herds in Illinois, he feeds to an empty bunk. 
So he doesn't have to worry about waybacks because remember, on feed efficiency, we don't count that against the calculation. It's only the feed, the dry matter the cow consumes. And, and so, uh, so so we have that big argument. Uh, this is one of our best herds in the state. And I said, you could be even a lot better if you do it right. But he smiles and says, well, I think a 102 pound tank average is enough. And I'll, I'll, I'll live with that as from, from that end that aspect there. But you're right. The, the, a lot of farmers, uh, you know, have no idea what that uh, push out is going to be. Our thumb rule is, maybe yours would be a little different, Barry, and that with our high, relatively high feed prices, we're looking at a push out of around two or three percent of the total ration dry matter. So, uh, you know, so if, if cows are eating 50 pounds of dry matter, and I always talk dry matter, then I'm going to uh, maybe have about a pound of, of leftover feed that is there if a cow or a group of cows are still hungry, they can still eat that feed, or I push that out because it may be sorted or it may have gone through a secondary fermentation, and then I will push that feed out and hopefully recycle that through another livestock group on the farm. Uh, the, the ideal one is if the uh, farm has some dairy beef, uh, that's a very logical place to stick it, or some farmers will put it on heifers. Uh, but then again, some of our bigger farms do not have dairy beef. They don't have replacement heifers. And in some cases, they even ship in the dry cows to a different location. So as my farmer said, oh, if I got a way back, what am I going to do with it? I'm not going to throw away that uh, that dry matter. And that dry matter here in Illinois, about 14 cents a pound, 14 to 15 cents. You go to California, it's higher. If you go to uh, further east, it might be a little bit lower. But anyway, that's kind of where, where we're at. And so that, that way back has real value. So uh, the first of all, a lot of farmers don't measure it. Second of all, what is that number, you know, and then what are you, what are you doing with with the way back uh, uh, on, on those farms. So you're right, uh, a lot of farmers uh, have no idea what that amount is. We do have farmers that will pick that up, uh, push it out uh, once a day. Uh, there is some research that say if we could push it out twice a day, and, and that's kind of like a clean plate. You and I would eat a clean plate every day. Maybe the cow needs the same thing. They'll push it out and then they'll put it back in their way, in their wagons and actually weigh it as far as that goes. And then we have some farmers that will actually test it. So they know what that nutrient value is. So if they put it into a heifer diet or, or something like that, they can, uh, you know, if, if a heifer eats uh, uh, four pounds of a way back on average, uh, we pretty much know the protein, energy, fiber content of that way back. And of course, it varies uh, from day to day, but still uh, uh, we can adjust rations for growing heifers very nicely. Absolutely. Well, I think, I think you made a good pitch for feed efficiency as being a really important KPI for dairies. And, and if people buy into that, maybe it's worth investing a little bit of effort um, and time into uh, trying to determine dry matter intake, uh, at least uh, occasionally, maybe once a week or something like that. Yeah, you know, Barry, one, well, we have a farmer here in our state that uh, he's got it all set up, mechanized. He gets feed efficiency every milking because he has got a uh, flow meter on his tank. So he knows from a group of cows and his group of cows are typically 400 cows. So he'll know how many pounds of milk comes out of that pen each each day. He know, of course, he's feeding to the empty bunk. So he knows exactly how many pounds of dry matter is. And therefore he gets every every day he gets feed efficiency on 10 different groups of animals. And his comment to me was a couple months, uh, months, uh, a couple years ago was, well, we don't do it every, I mean, we, I would look at it every day, but I do a weekly average. And so if that number is drifting up, which means better feed efficiency, I'm saying hurrah for me. If it's drifting down, then I need to find out is my feeder doing something wrong or something going on in the herd that we need to make an adjustment from. So uh, with these new tools we have on farms, the ability to, to know exactly uh, what, what the the pounds and the makeup of those TMRs going in there and, and milk yield, we, we can really fine tune this, uh, this, this program very, very nicely. And I smile here because one of the most critical people on the farm that really makes me nervous is the feeder. Who is your feeder and what is her or his skill set, you know, and how much commitment do they have because they control that diet. And boy, I understand milking is important. I understand her health is important, but uh, that dry matter going to that cow, how uh, consistent is uh, that from day to day? Absolutely. I'm going to shift gears a little here, Mike, and I, I don't want to embarrass you, but um, I've been on several uh, conference planning committees and, you know, often we'll get surveys back from attendees. And um, I think any conference you've ever been in, I would put 
all my money on you as having the highest ratings from attendees. So I wanted to ask you, what, what do you think is the key to being an effective educator in general or, or a communicator, uh, especially in a technical realm? Well, I, I think, uh, Barry, that, that's a really fun question to sort through and think about. Uh, number one, I guess I need to know my audience, you know. Who is in the audience? Uh, at times, we will speak to students, obviously, in classroom environment. Uh, we will talk to dairy farmers. Uh, in some cases, we need to know, are these very large dairy farms with thousands of cows or 400 cows, 300 cows, 200 cow dairy? Because I, I think how we may pitch uh, the information becomes a really, a really important. So kind of knowing, knowing your crowd. Uh, one of uh, professors no longer with us at the University of Wisconsin, when I left to go to Minnesota as extension dairyman, he says, he told me, he said, Mike, there's two things I want to challenge you with. One is uh, what you what you say. And in other words, uh, current, up to date, applicable to the farm, uh, take home messages. Uh, um, in most cases, farmers will come with a notebook. And, and if nobody writes anything down, Barry, that I've missed the mark. In other words, there's nothing I said that was worthwhile remembering or writing down or going from there. And then the third factor would come into play, and, and that is uh, how you deliver it. And that was one of my really big challenges in the first uh, couple of years going to the University of Minnesota was, well, how do I package this? Uh, you know, how much humor do we bring into play? Uh, how much fun do we have? Uh, how do we get farmers to actually listen there for an hour and a half or two hours uh, at this point? And, and so I had to beg, borrow, and steal. I watched a lot of my colleagues present information and said, gee, that's kind of neat how he or she did that. I think I'll try that, you know. And, and so the question is uh, trying to develop a, a, a presentation style that uh, – that, uh, keeps the, the, the student, uh, the professional, the veterinarian, the dairy farmer tuned in to the presentation. So I, I guess I'm not sure if I'm totally successful with all those, but to me, those are three pretty important factors that come into play to try to deliver a, a good program because these people are giving me 45 minutes to an hour, and that's typically the length of presentations that I end up giving here, although once in a while they're all dayers, and boy, I think I'm getting too old for that, Barry, to go for. <laughs> Those are exhausting. <laughs> very hard. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, the, the question is, what, 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 what did they learn? Are they given me time, and, and that time has value. And if they just sat there and drank coffee and maybe ate a donut, maybe that's if that's your goal, good for you. But hopefully uh, they came to sit down and listen and said, maybe there is a couple nuggets that we can take home. And that's my job. So, uh, you know, this year it has to do with high input pr prices of feed, fertilizer, and, 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 and that, you know, uh, inflation gets to be a big factor. And so uh, our talks this year are going to be pretty economical driven at this point uh, as, as we go through it. Great advice. I love that. Okay, we've got three wrap-up questions that we ask every guest, and I'm uh, on the edge of my seat, so to speak, to, to hear what your responses here will be. So first one, what, what's your favorite dairy-related book or resource? Well, Barry, your listeners are going to smile because I'm going to say Hordes, Dairymen, and Professional Dairy Magazines. And I, I think that they, were, they, they were my first choice. Uh, be, because they are very current. They have cutting edge. What's going on right now in the field? It comes out once or twice a month. And uh, they have writers both from the industry and from the universities and dairy farmers themselves material in the publications. And uh, Barry, uh, when Horse Dairyman comes in my mailbox, I have to read that in the next day or two because there's always a risk someone's going to call up and say, gee, Mike, did you see what Michigan State said about this or that? And if you don't read the magazine, then you're between, well, you can't answer, can't answer the question or make, make the comment. So th that is my first choice. And, and, and so I, I rate that number one. Uh, number two, uh, your listeners probably won't be surprised, Journal of Dairy Science is my number two choice. Uh, that's the most recent research. Uh, I must admit there's probably every, uh, out of every one of those booklets, there's five or six articles that are what I call keepers. Um, I, I smile because in my dairy magazines, I tear out what I call the keeper articles so I can find them quickly and file them and, and, and get access to them. And then the third one, which may surprise you a little bit, and, and that is the, the various NRCs. 
Uh, and, and of course, I smile because a new one just came out, and it, it's a five a 487 pages of cutting edge research summary. And I can refer to that when questions come in on a mineral, for example, or a, a amino acid. Uh, I've got a wonderful resource there. So those would be my three. I know you only want one, but if I had to pick one, it'd be my it'd be, it'd be my my two dairy magazines. Fair enough. You at least listed a first choice. Okay, good. Um, what is your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? Well, it's interesting because I'm going to cheat on you again, Barry. Uh, in terms of the non-fictional, I really enjoy reading history. So, you know, one, one of the books I really enjoyed was uh, the, the Greatest Generation by Tom Burkle. And, and so I, I like those kinds of publications there. And if you go to the fiction, I'm a big John Grisham fan. So I just love their books. And uh, in fact, some of them end up being movies as well. So I cheated on you again. So I give you two different examples. <laughs> those are good. I like that. And lastly, uh, in your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are less successful? Yeah, and again, uh, Barry, my apology, I'm going to cheat on you again. I'm, I'm going to look at, at universities, for example, uh, that, that group of f professionals, you know, and, and basically we're looking, I was primarily in extension and teaching. And so I'm, I'm looking there that, uh, first of all, you really have to love teaching. You have to enjoy teaching students or teaching dairy farmers or teaching adults because it's, it's all in the education business as far as that goes. Then you also have to stay very current, uh, especially if you're talking to dairy farmers. Uh, you, you can't talk about the old stuff. you got to be sure you're there from that aspect. And then, of course, we mentioned earlier the delivery system. I think those are the characteristics from uh, the land-grad college or the university side. If I'm in a dairy professional uh, working with dairy farmers, specifically, specifically a feed company, a genetics company, a feed additive company. Then I guess I, I, I look at such things as the training these people have and their background uh, so they can talk the language. And that's going to be a big challenge because a lot of my students coming to the University of Illinois and going to grad school may be deficient in that area. So at times they will join us making farm trips uh, when I was still uh, teaching there, I'd say, well, we're going to go to a farm here. Any grad students want to ride along, we're going to do a walk through on a farm. And we normally would get two or three students depending on, on their schedule. So background training will be important. Certainly um, the ability to be responsive. So when a farmer calls, uh, you can't wait two weeks to get a response back. So you got to be responsive, responsive to him and be available as far as that goes. And then be uh cutting edge, be aware of what's going on. So those are uh, the, when you say dairy professionals, I kind of broke it into a, a university aspect and then also an industry uh, in the field aspects. Good advice, Mike. Thank you. Great answers. Well, I think that about wraps us up for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hutchins, for spending time talking through this. I think that'll be a fantastic episode for people to listen to. Very good. Well, thanks very much, Barry, for the invitation opportunity to be part of, of your uh, your program here today and wish you the very best uh, coming up in uh, 2023. Thank you. And with that, uh, this is Barry Bradford signing off. Please uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Dairy Podcast Show to hear more excellent content like this.